The West was one. The West was one religiously. The West was one spiritually because a group of people understood their goal was to win the West. Not to impose something on people, not to threaten people with something, but to win them. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he's like the ultimate example of this because Jesus exits the Apostle Paul He decides, hey, I'm gonna go into the non-Jewish world and explain to them that God has done something in our midst. I'm gonna go to the non-Jewish world and I wanna create Jesus followers out of people who have no interest in being a Jesus follower. I wanna create Jesus followers out of people who have their own religion, their own way of life, their own worldview, and they're not looking for a new one. And do you know what approach he took? Here's how he describes it in his letter to the Corinthians, a really tough group of people to convince. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave. In other words, I don't power up. I don't get judgmental. I, you know, I don't get all high and mighty. I've made myself a slave to everyone, and then here's his phrase, to win as many as possible. Then he goes on to say this, I've become a Jew to the Jews to win as many as possible. I've become like one who doesn't have the law to those who don't have the law to win as many as possible. I've become like a Gentile to the Gentiles to win as many as possible. Paul, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to win as many as possible. Why are you trying to do that? Because Jesus said, I want you to go into all this world and I want you to create people and I want you to cause people to become my follower. And I've learned my only way to do this is to win them. Now, let me ask you a question because you know all about this. I wanna ask you to raise your hand. Have you ever won a contract? Have you ever won someone's heart? How'd you do that? How'd you do that? I know how you did it. I know how you won your contract. You made them, for the most part, you made them wanna use your product more than they wanted to use the competitor's product. You made your product look so good, they said, well, I'd be crazy not to use your product. You made the price look so good, they said, I'd be crazy not to win your product, use your product. You won them over by convincing them your product's better than everybody else's product. How did you win her heart? How did you win his heart? You made you the most attractive one, right? You won them over by making them want you more than they wanted anybody else. You don't win people's heart by imposing your will. You don't win a contract by imposing your will. The word that the Apostle Paul chooses here is so strategic. He said, here's my relationship to those who are outside the believing Jesus community. I want to win them, and so I will become whatever I need to become in order to convince that this is a better way, convince this is a better product, convince this is something worth giving your attention to. I want to draw them, draw them, draw them, draw them. I want them to peer over the edge. I'm not going to push them away. I'm not going to coerce them. I want to win them, and I'll do whatever it takes to win those who are far from God and who are wondering if there's a way to connect with God, their creator. And again, for the first 300 years, that was the approach everybody took. That was the only approach the church had. But then somewhere along the way, they decided we're not gonna leverage love anymore. We're gonna leverage our power. We're going to leverage our authority. We're gonna go from winning to threatening. We're gonna go from God is love to God will get you. And whenever the church, whenever Christians, whenever believers leverage anything other than the love of God, we go backwards every single time. Now, that's kind of anecdotal. What I want to do now is I want to take you to a place in the New Testament where Paul actually teaches this. I mean, I've just sort of used Jesus as an example. Here's Paul as an example. But the Apostle Paul actually teaches us this. And and, and again, if this kind of rubs you the wrong way, you're thinking, I don't know, then, then that's okay. Just go home and get your Bible out and look it up for yourself. Because I think, I'm convinced, because we've gotten this wrong, and I'm not the first person to say this, this isn't unique insight. Because we've gotten this wrong, we have set ourselves unnecessarily at odds with culture. Because see, here's what I believe, and if you're not a Jesus follower, a Christian or church person, just so you know, we think we've discovered something phenomenal. We think you can have peace with God. We think habits can be broken. We think marriages can be restored. We think prodigal children and their parents can, those relationships can be restored. We think God can land in the area of your money, your profession, his will. I mean, we think God loves you and we want you to know that. And it doesn't really do us any good not telling you and it doesn't really do us any good if we do tell you, but we feel compelled to try to let you know this incredible news called the gospel, the good news. But the problem is our approach sometimes is terrible. And I don't know how it got confused, but it got confused. So in the book of 1 Corinthians, um, the Apostle Paul explains 
and approach, and he gives us a little theology that somehow slips off the table. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 5, or I'll put it right up here real quickly. The Apostle Paul wrote four letters to the church in Corinth. We lost two of them. I mean, I didn't lose them, but you know, in the first century, they disappeared. We don't know where they are. He references these letters. We don't have copies of them, but two letters survived. He went to Corinth. Corinth was like Las Vegas. What happened in Corinth, you know, stays in Corinth. It was a very, very immoral, I mean, party city. It was a port city, south, about 50 miles southwest of Athens, if you want to find it when you get home, the ancient city of, of Corinth. Um, very, very pagan, very, very sensual. And so he goes there and he starts a little Jesus community and he teaches them the ways of Jesus, but they're surrounded by a culture that, you know, is just not going to have any of that. So he would write them letters of encouragement. You know, here's how you follow Jesus in a culture like that. Here's how you follow Jesus in, in a world like that. Well, he gets news wherever he is that there's really some really, really nasty stuff going on in the church in Corinth. In fact, he gets news, there's something going on in the church in Corinth that even the people outside the church thinks, uh-uh, nobody does that. And so he's addressing this very, what are you talking about, you're, you're, you gotta be kidding me, kind of issue. And in addressing this issue, he gives us some insight and some teaching into how Jesus followers, disciples, are to respond to people who've decided not to be Jesus followers. So here's how, here's how the story begins. He says this, right in the middle of the letter. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans don't tolerate. Woo, I'm talking about, this is like, and now this is important. What he introduces us to is this, that there is a Jesus follower morality and there is a non-Jesus follower, pagan, or you know, outside the church morality. Everybody has standards, even the Romans had standards, the Greeks had standards, the followers of Jesus, the Christians had standards. Paul says there's two different standards. There's the church standard and there's the non-church standard. And he says this, what's going on in your church is so bad, even the pagans are going, are you kidding me? That's gross, nobody does that, ah, okay? So now you, know, you wanna know what it is, don't you? Okay, here's, here's. <laughs> Here's what was going on, all right? You think your church is crazy. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you're proud. Now, just I, this guy wasn't sleeping with his mom, okay? I think Paul would have said that, okay? Uh, and, but what he was talking about, probably, we don't know for sure, is there was a guy in the church, his, dad, his mom had died perhaps, or maybe his parents had gotten divorced, his dad remarried, and somewhere along the way, this guy is hooking up with his dad's either current but probably ex-wife. And even the pagans go, oh, dude, you don't do that. Nobody does that. That's just weird, okay? So that, that doesn't fit into anybody's standard of, of what's proper. And the language here seems to indicate that this wasn't like a one-time thing, you know? I got up one night and she was brushing her teeth. The next thing you know, and I'm sorry, it wasn't that. This was like an ongoing relationship, okay? And so Paul's going, are you kidding? You're letting this go on and you guys are proud? Now, Here's something you need to understand. They're, the church in Corinth wasn't like our churches, okay? They weren't big. There may have been 50 people. When you think church, think more like a large community group or a large small group, okay? So when people showed up, everybody knew what everybody was doing. So this, this guy's showing up at somebody's house, they're doing coffee and cake before they have their Bible study and everybody's like, okay, we have to bring this up, okay? Everybody's taught, it's not like they can sit on the back row and kind of sneak in and sneak out. This, our church is better in that way because we got all kind of stuff going on here we don't know about, okay? But in this, in this, hopefully not this, but anyway, but who knows? Okay, so in this community, but in this community, every, everybody knew and nobody is addressing it. Nobody's, you know, talking to the guy. So the apostle Paul goes on, he says this, shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out, of your, put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? I mean, shouldn't you have addressed this? Now, he focuses on the man to which we wanna say, okay, what about the woman? I mean, what about his father's wife or his father's ex-wife? I mean, why didn't she brought him this? Why are you picking on the guy? He says, shouldn't you have gone into mourning and, and you know, kick the guy out who's doing this? For my part, he goes on, for my part, even though I am not physically present, because he's writing this in a letter, I am with you in spirit as one who is present with you in this way, and then check this out, I have already passed judgment. Oh, to which we say, okay, time out, Paul. Let me need to explain something to you. See, the Bible, teaches, the Bible teaches you're not supposed to judge others. 
How many of you have heard that? The Bible teaches you're not supposed to judge others. You're afraid to raise your hand. I know, because, okay. The Bible teaches, you know, okay, Paul, we need to explain something to you before you get through wild and crazy. The Bible teaches you're not supposed to judge others, to which Paul would say, I'm writing the Bible. Thank you, okay, this is in the Bible. It's like, oh, well, I'm just so confused now, because I've always been taught the Bible. Now, so let me clear up something, maybe you came just for this. The Bible, and, you, and this will make you the smartest person at the next dinner party, or the smartest person in the office, because this comes up all the time. You shouldn't judge, the Bible says, you, here's the deal. The Bible doesn't say we shouldn't judge, the Bible tells us who to judge. The Bible doesn't tell us not to judge, the Bible tells us who to judge. And the Apostle Paul's like, you know what, I, don't even, I haven't even met this guy, but if what you're saying about him is true, I've already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus. How's that? On the one who has been doing this. I've already passed judgment, and here's why I passed judgment. Because this guy is in the Jesus community. He's a follower of Jesus. He has signed on to be a disciple, and now his behavior is like way out of whack with the Jesus followers. In fact, even the non-Jesus followers are laughing. So he goes on in the next part of the, of, of the passage and he explains, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put this guy out. In fact, he says something really strong. He says, I want you to give him custody. I want you to make, give him custody and make Satan his uh, custodian. That's what he says. I want you to turn him over to Satan. It's a legal phrase he uses. It's like parole officer. I want you to make Satan his parole officer. I'd like you to meet your parole officer, Satan. <laughs> and it's this figurative language, but he says something really strong. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, I want you to tell this guy, if you wanna do that, that's fine, you just can't do it here, right? So you go out there and do that, and, and here's what the Apostle Paul knew, here's what some of you have learned the hard way, here's what everyone learns eventually. You know that sin always has a consequence? So you might not even believe in sin, that's okay, but did you know sin always has a consequence? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, that doesn't mean you die physically, everybody dies physically, but every time you sin, there, there's, a, there's a death of sorts. Some of you started doing something that was really fun and now it's an addiction. See, every sin has a death, every sin has a consequence. You got into a relationship and it was great, 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 and now it's bad, 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 and you're like, oh, I wish I'd never done this, and you kinda knew you shouldn't have, because see, it doesn't matter if you're a religious person or not, every sin has has a consequence, and so the Apostle Paul saying, look, get him out there so he'll face the full consequences of his sin, so he'll come running back here, and say, oh, I never should have done that, I repent, and then you can take him back. So this isn't a send him to hell, this is a, hey, let's just get him back here as quick as possible. Sometimes, the shortest route back is to get all the way into your sin, and let it beat you up really bad, and then you come on back to a church like ours, and you can be with the rest of us beat up sinners, okay? That, that's how it works, so now, <clears throat> Now, here's what happened. So, Paul is writing all this, and it occurs to him, it occurs to him, oh, I think I know why they're so confused about this. Because in my previous letter, one of them that we lost, in my previous letter, I said something I bet they took the wrong way. So now Paul decides to clear up something he might think they were confused about from a previous letter, and it's here that he comes right down and answers the question for us, how are we supposed to respond? How are Jesus followers supposed to respond to people who aren't Jesus followers, who are living in such a way that's outside the bounds and outside the rules of Christianity or outside the rules of what a Jesus follower should do. How do we respond to those people? So he clears it up, he says this. I wrote to you in my letter, this is a letter we've lost. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. And they're like, yeah, we remember that. You said don't associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world that is outside the Jesus follower community who are immoral or greedy and swindlers or idolaters, in that case, you would have to leave this world. Now that's helpful, isn't it? Because some of you go to family reunions and you're going, I'm not even sure I should be around these people, okay, right? Or you go to work, it's like, I, you know, I'm trying to be a Jesus follower. These people are creepy. You know, these people are everything I used to be. Am I even supposed to be here listening to this? Should I even go with them? And the Apostle Paul is going, yes. You're, you're not supposed to divorce yourself relationally from everybody who's not a Jesus follower just because they're immoral, greedy, swindlers, idolaters. You just, you just have to leave the world. I'm not, I'm not saying you should do that. So the first thing we learn is, for those of us who wanna be disciples, we're not supposed to disengage from people who have habits or behavior or morality that we don't agree with. But now I'm writing you, he says, let me make sure you know what I'm talking about. But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone, now look at this language, who claims to be, he doesn't use the word Christian, why? 
because he didn't use the word Christian because they didn't use that term when they were talking about themselves. But you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, that's their terminology for believers, insiders, but, is, but who is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. Don't even eat with such people. So he's saying, let me make sure you got this. You're supposed to judge the people on the inside, but you don't have any business judging the people on the outside. But if there's somebody on the inside in your Jesus community, in your community group, in your leadership team, and basically they're kind of living in the wrong direction is another way to think about this. You know, they're, they're just, they're, you know, we know what Jesus teaches and we believe everything Jesus teaches, but in terms of my lifestyle, I'm kind of living in the wrong direction. He says, okay, you're supposed to judge that person. You're supposed to hold them accountable to the Jesus living, the Jesus teaching kind of of lifestyle, you're supposed to hold them accountable. And then he asked the question that takes us right to the epicenter of his point. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? The answer is, it's none of my business. So let me ask you this question. What business, if you're a Jesus follower, you're, you would call yourself a Christian, but now we're all afraid to use that because the pastor will get mad. I know how that's going. Now I'm a disciple, but disciple, oh, disciple, that's so, I'm like between a Christian and a disciple. I'm not really a Christian, but I, you know, okay. But if you're sort of moving in that direction, the question is, what business is it of yours to hold a non-Jesus person, a non-Jesus follower accountable for their behavior? What business is it of yours? And the answer is, it's none of your business. Now, let me be clear. I'm not talking about the civil or the federal law, okay? This, you know, that's a whole different kind of law, whole different set of rules. I'm not talking about the Constitution, okay? I'm talking about if you're gonna be a follower of Jesus, here's how you handle your marriage. Here's what you do with your money. Here's how you do honesty. Here's how you do business. It, what business do I have of trying to hold someone who never ascribed to that or never subscribed to that standard of living? What business do I have of trying to hold them accountable to a standard they never signed up for to begin with? Paul says, it's absolutely none of your business. See, the reason you used to go to church, some of you, the reason you don't want to have anything to do with the church, some of you, is you felt like there was a group of Christians judging you for your behavior. You never signed up to act the way they wanted you to act to begin with, and you felt judged. And I just gotta tell you, that isn't your fault. That's our fault. That, that's a group of people who tried to leverage something other than love, and it went backwards, didn't it? Didn't it? And our country and our world is full of people who have faced that and experienced that. In the first century, here's the deal. They didn't, they didn't expect non-Jesus followers to behave like Jesus followers. They just didn't expect that. They expected Jesus followers. Here's a game changer. They expected Jesus followers to behave like Jesus followers. And so Paul wraps up his past, the passage with this. He says this, are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. He uses that J word again. Aren't you supposed to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Now we get this so backwards. The church is notorious, the church is notorious for policing the behavior of people outside the church while they do a very poor job policing the behavior of people inside the church. The apostle Paul, who kind of got this whole thing started, said, no, it's the other way around. You need to do a better job policing yourselves and lay off everybody else. They're not accountable to you. They're not accountable to your standard of morality. They're not accountable to your standard of honesty. They never signed up for this. You have no business judging people outside the church. You are to judge yourselves. Now, the, the judge word, I know that, that kind of gets all over us. We kind of like it better to say that the Bible says nobody's supposed to judge. But look, if you're a parent or you've ever been a kid, you understand this, okay? If, you've, if you're a parent or you've ever been a kid, okay, that's all of you. Just want to make sure nobody laughed. I thought that was kind of funny, all right? All of you, if you've ever been a kid or a child, you understand this. In your household, in your household, you had rules, and when you disobeyed the rules, the judge showed up and it was either your mom or your dad or they, they came together and they judged you. They said, in this household, here's how we live, here's what we do. If you're gonna live here, here's how we get along. It's not a good household that doesn't have rules. It's not a good household and it's not good parenting if there's never any judgment. So when my kids break the rules, I hold them accountable. That's all Paul's talking about. 
That once you become a part of the body of the church, once you join the Jesus followers, there's rules, there's standards, and there's accountability. And we have been called to judge each other, but we have no business, no business, no business judging people's morality or their, whether they use their money or whether they live their lives outside the church.